afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the latest in our session on the prop and real estate, um, our investing masterclass. Today, we're going to cover our market outlook for 2024 and beyond. Um, today, we're joined by Jai Nandia and Kirat Dillon. Um, Jai, it's been a while since you've been on a webinar. A lot of the investors have been asking where you've been. Um, but to start with, for the people that are new to Shojin, perhaps give us an introduction to yourself, Jai. Yeah, sure. So I'm Jatin Ondia, CEO of Shojin Property Partners. Uh, background is investment banking, spent about 12 years with UBS, um, started Shojin in 2009, really as a way to enable more people to invest into the real estate sector on a fractional basis. So. Today, I'm responsible really to kind of work with the team on the overall strategy um, and really just focusing on growing the business uh, on a global basis. Kira. Um, hi, I'm Kira Dillon. My background's in private equity real estate as well as uh, private banking. Um, I work with the private clients team here at Trojan. Um, I've been here for just under six months now. Really? Already? <laughs> So just to give a background to Shojin, Shojin is, Shojin is an online investment platform that allows investors from all over the world to invest into UK property projects at the development stage. Um, we've, as Jack mentioned, we've been around since 2009. Um, and yeah, um, you know, offer investment opportunities across the capital stack from juniors, senior, mes, um, and beyond. Um, so, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, side. I'm gonna... Uh so um, but today we've been missing um, James Wilmerson, who's usually <laughs> sorts the text so far, but we'll get there, I think. Okay, okay. here we go. Um, to start with <clears throat> the risk warning, as a reminder, um, our investments are high risk and you capital is at risk when you invest in Shojin products. And just to just reiterate the background to what Shojin is, um, an online investment platform, we just covered that earlier. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, my fault. Right. No, 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 that's <laughs> absolutely fine. Um, so just to get right into it, um, to begin with, I guess, are we starting at the highest possible level? What's going on in the stock market? What's going on in which stock markets are, ind are indications of what's going on in the general economy? So you can see from the chart there, um, the US um, indices are doing a lot better than the UK ones, but all in all, they're quite a rising. Um, I guess your thoughts on what that says about the world right now and the implications for guess, real estate? Well, I mean, to start off at a pretty basic level, um, the FTSE 100 is doing very well. The liquid markets are doing well. Investor sentiment is positive. Um, we're at a better position relative to the start of the year. Uh, I think we'll come to this, but you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about inflation and interest rates and how that's affected sort of mortgage take-up rates <coughs> and everything else. But in general, I think this is just an indication of positivity and a brighter outlook for the rest of 2024, um, as well as going into 2025. I mean, I'm not going to add much to that because we're going to focus on the real estate side. I mean, the only interesting thing to note is um, how the FTSE is performing compared to uh, the US indices. So uh, there are multiple issues at work there, but really this is not uh, a webinar about the stock markets globally. Uh, so what we really want to focus on is the fact that markets have generally gotten stronger over the last couple of years, confidence starting to return, um, and this is all based on you know uh, inflation expectations, interest rate expectations, and so on. So let's just jump into those parts. But just, just to start, what, what is technically usually the relationship between the stock market and real estate market? Are they correlated um, proportionally as when stock markets rise to as real estate prices rise or not? It's an interesting one. Um, and, and th there are so many different ways of looking at it, but if you take the most basic, basic thing, when confidence generally in an economy is high, everything moves up, right? Rising tide and all that. When, when things are softening, it, it kind of depends on what exactly is going on. So for example, you can get parts of the market which are softening, yeah. um, whereas real estate often is uh, a more stable asset for the long run. So it's also a store of value. So, you know, for example, and again, there are so many um, connections between all the data, but you know, as a very simple thing, if inflation is high, people want to move to things uh, that uh, preserve value, like like real estate. Real estate goes up. Um, a lot of the, the 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 market then reacts in different ways because obviously, if inflation is high, interest rates going to go up. If interest rates go up, that affects uh, how companies can borrow money and the cost of expansion and so on. So there are so many things at, at work on this. Yeah, great. Uh, moving to the next slide. Um, 
So this is gives you a you know sort of vindication of the past ten years of what the interest rate, inter inflation rate has been. As you, as you can see, there was that spike in the last two years, and it is starting to come down. Um, but what, what's been driving that, and what where do you guys see it going? Because you know there was there was expectations that it would drop to two percent by this time, but it hasn't. But it's dropping. Mm -hmm. But is it as fast as expected? What are some thoughts? Do you want to start? Yeah, I'd say back a little bit. Look, the inflationary rate is stabilizing and I think we can all sort of agree with that mm -hmm. and that's sort of that's what we've seen is it dropping sort of as strongly as we'd expected probably not but do we expect it to keep dropping maybe not in the next you know not in the near near term but relatively soon the trend is you know a relative drop in rate because we have you know the targeted rate that's remained at about two percent and that's sort of that's where we're tracking to um, how long are we going to take to get there? One quarter, two quarters, sort of depends on who you ask. Um, but it's a relatively positive sign relative to where we are, where, sort of where we were, um, and we're just we're more optimistic. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd simply add to that, you know. <sighs> Inflation has been on a downward trajectory for for a while. Yeah. One thing, sorry, something's rattling on the table. One one thing to to remember though is that inflation is a relative number, right? So prices aren't actually coming down. It just means they're going up more slowly. So you know a lot of the pain everybody has already felt, i.e., their their pound today is worth less or can buy less than a pound, let's say, two years ago. But there is a downward trajectory. You know, we know we know some of the reasons why inflation shot up in the first place. Obviously, post COVID, the big um, the supply uh, kind of um, issues uh, around the world. But then, of course, the conflict in in Europe, uh, in Ukraine, and and then um, the the situation in the Middle East. Now, what is quite good, I think, if if there's if there's a takeaway from this, is the recent. Uh, uh, escalation hasn't actually caused a major panic in market. So people do believe it's going to be fairly well contained. Um, so inflation will come down. It is stubborn, um, but it will come down. Um, but it, it, it now is more slower than what people previously uh, thought. Uh, and that's probably reflected in interest rate expectations because I believe we're going yeah, to move on to that, right? Next, next slide, yeah. Um, um. I mean, yeah, I mean, on, on this, the... Um, I mean, if you look at, I mean, obviously you've got interest rates as in central bank interest rates, but you, you know, if, if you just look on the front line mortgage rates, there was a period, I think have you got mortgages mortgage as well? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so you know, if, if you go back about six, nine months, everyone thought inflation was going to come down much faster. So yeah. uh, lenders started offering much cheaper mortgages. They've, they've actually increased them slightly. I mean, you yeah, can see you it's... Can see on, on can you side, there you go. In the recent quarter, there was, I think, a 0.1% increase in the, the rate yeah. for two years. And um, just a reminder, sort of the mortgage rates are predictors of sentiment mm -hmm. based on the lenders. So where do they expect the rates to be? Because for the most part, I mean, you're looking at a lot of these products, two, three, five-year fixed products. So that's sentiment-driven because what they're really doing is they're taking a forward outlook on what the mortgage rates are going to be and then pricing your mortgage sort of as a result of that. So it's, and if we go back a slide, it's an indicator that comes back to, okay, where do we see the interest rates going? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's an obvious question, but is that, I, was, when I was you know, new to the uh, working, I realized that, how can, if the bank interest rate is 5 to 5 percent how can a bank offer me at 4.7%? But I guess mm -hmm. that's, that's what you're saying there, it's the prediction that they're going to come down over that two year period, right? Yeah, I mean, re remember what's going on behind the scenes, yeah. right? The yeah. bank mm -hmm. isn't itself making a prediction. The bank is borrowing money in the market. Yes, yeah, so they're borrowing from the government at 5.25, no? Not, no, not no, the, government, the government, from, oh. from the market. Okay, okay, okay. But, but the market, if you're lending money on a 10-year basis, mm -hmm. like, for example, if they issue a 10-year bond, the, you know, they're looking at the forward curve. They're looking at the 10, you know, to borrow for 10 years, what mm -hmm. will it cost me? Now, you can often get these situations where the current interest rate is higher, mm -hmm. But because they expect rates to go down over the next few years, if you lock in a loan today, they'll give it to you at that rate in 10 years' time. Why? Because as much as it's high now, it's going to come down, and that's the rate at which they're comfortable lending for the whole 10 years. Okay. So that's what kind of underpins mortgages. So there, there, there is a connection between base rates and mortgages. Obviously, if it's a variable, it's mm -hmm. a direct connection. But if it's a fixed-rate mortgage, it's really using the forward curves, and that's really a, a function of where... The, the world 
thinks interest rates are going to be in the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years. And then I guess, so with these three, inflation, interest rates, and then mortgage rates, is, is inflation drives the interest rates, which drives the mortgage rates? Or is it the interest rates drive the inflation? What, what, where, where does it, is it, or is it depending on the macro environment, what, what drives what? <laughs> that, 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 that's, the relationship between inflation and interest rates is a complicated one. <laughs> the general trend is if interest rates are going up, we're usually in an inflationary environment. Mm. It's, yeah. it's a yeah. broad statement. Um, there's a more direct correlation between interest rates and mortgage rates, mm. um, especially if you have a variable rate mortgage. Um, yeah. <laughs> but but e even beyond that direct correlation, you know, once again, and uh, I don't mean this to be a cop out answer, but <laughs> there are so many factors. Yeah. Like, for example, um, most of you will remember before the financial crisis, rates were around five percent, I believe. Yeah. But yet, you could borrow at three and a half percent, right? And and th there's another element that comes to this, which is the liquidity in the global markets. People wanting to put money to work. Back then, it was obviously securitization. People taking different parts of the. Uh, the, the, the risk level when they're packaging up mortgages. So there's a number of factors at play. Um, but, but the broad kind of confidence in the market and the future has a big bearing on everything. So, and that sentiment is good. Mm. We're yeah. better yeah, yeah, yeah. than you know, where we Today were. Today that sentiment ago. is good. Yeah. Um, some people will look at a graph like this and say, well, all right, well, if sentiment's so good, why are we saying in the next two years rates are going to be, what, just under 4%? Um, and, and I think one must remember that the long-term average uh, interest rate is not close to zero. This is something for over a decade people got used to. But the reality is natural level of interest rates should be around the 4% mark. Um, if not a bit higher, actually. Yeah, so because the, I think that graph, if you zoom out a little bit, it probably is more level, isn't it? It's just because it shows the last 10 years where it, it has been 1%. Right? I guess it's gone down. Yeah. It was artificially yeah. held at that yeah. rate to encourage sort of, well, liquidity within the markets. And we've sort of, we've come to a point where there's a natural expectation that we want to keep it to a reasonable level. Now, if we go back to a similar cycle in the future, that's a separate story. But we're just, that's not where sentiment is or, you know, the market sort of, is if we go idea. back to that again in the future, it means something's gone <laughs> massively wrong in the world. And honestly, I don't think the world can take any more shocks, right? So, But it means the UK is seen as a safe haven. True. True. <laughs> so, you know, um, I mean, even now, right, there's a lot of people um, piling money into UK real estate. Uh, you see this particularly during stressful times in other markets where it is seen as a safe haven. Yeah. And even now, I mean, the, the, I, I was reading a, a, a strange statistic, and we'll go on to the market prices and things yeah. in a moment, but something that actually has been performing pretty well is the very, very top end of the market. Well, because the investors sort of that kind of disappeared during COVID, um, that were just looking for deals, are now back and looking for, well, vacation homes, for lack of a better word. It's, it's that top echelon of, well, I'd say London, but it's not just London. It's the key cities and, you know, some of the wealthier suburban areas that really have these ultra-luxury residences that are now coming back to market, and you're seeing new developments at that's higher even price Mayfair, points. Isn't it? Was it most expensive in the world? Yeah. Two, billion, two billion pounds? That, so that's right. Mayfair, yeah. the, the projected um, rental growth in Mayfair has uh, gone up. Carphone Warehouse. Yeah, chap. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, his 12,000 a square foot, was it? Or something I mean, they're pro projecting that goes up to 15,000 in the next two years for the newer developments because you've also got sort of the Four Seasons Service Departments mm -hmm. have just come up. Mandarin Oriental is just launching their products. So there is positive sentiment. The top tier of investors are coming back. Um, historically, a lot of that was Chinese and Russian. Now that's shifted to American capital that's coming back to the UK which is not to say that Chinese capital has disappeared, it hasn't. Um, we see, still see a lot of investors coming out of Hong Kong, out of India, Southeast Asia as a whole. India, there's a lot I'm hearing. As, as well as Africa. Yeah. Um, so we're seeing a lot of movement. Uh, just, um, so li live on camera today, do you guys want to make a bet on the interest rate in a year? <laughs> but, um, you know, I guess our expectation is, uh, what Jackie, he says 3% in two years. No Jack chance. says no way. And no Kira, chance. Take a I, I'd say 25 percent What? I, look, I, no. I, I think they're going to have to be, to be competitive in the global environment, they're going to have to be a little... No chance. More I'll, I will take that bet. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think, look, I, I reckon you're looking at about 
two cuts this year mm. at best. Three if we're very lucky, but I reckon two. Next year, maybe three or four. Weirdly, I think around the 4%. This is saying slightly below four. I reckon around the 4% mark by the end of next year. Okay, nice. It's bizarre that someone more optimistic than, than Jay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just uh, moving on to we've seen this, we've got through the slide. <clears throat> Actually, just quickly going back there, um, with the uh, interest rates, what is the implication on the American interest rates? Does, does, that, does the F Federal Reserve's um, monetary policy and the ECB, does that drive UKs? Who usually makes the first move in going downwards? Or is that just depending on economy? The economy? Fed's usually more active mm -hmm. because, I mean, the way they're structured, there's a they lot They haven't more. had a cut yet, right? They've not cut? They since. stopped. Okay. They oh, stopped. they had one cut and they, they yeah. held it. Okay. Um, they're talking about cuts mm -hmm. and potentially not cuts. There's mm -hmm. always a lot more talk in mm -hmm. the UK, US mm -hmm. than there is in the UK. Um, but yeah, there's no, I wouldn't say there's a direct relationship, mm -hmm. but more that's definitely a global sentiment driver. Mm -hmm. um, but but, but they're, more, their more inflation's the, more stubborn, right? Even it now. is more stubborn because they, they also have other risks as part of the capital stacks as it relates to real estate, especially the commercial loan market. Mm -hmm. um, so they haven't sorted that out yet, as well as the, the lack of faith in the local banks, mm -hmm. which is something that was you know, a result of the last banking crisis in the US. Mm -hmm. So there's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. okay. No, let's I think you might be right. Actually, I'm not sure if they have had a cut. I think they were going to. They, they held, did they? I'm sure they held. They held. The last committee held, I believe. Mm. I'm not. Okay. Sort of, don't quote yeah. me on that. But. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and again, one of the factors driving um, the inflation is, is the fact that the economy is performing quite well um, with the the employ em employment at all time lows. Unemployment <laughs> at all time lows, sorry. Um, and I guess, what, what is that? <laughs> Such a bad graph. Why? We're, we're not a fan of it. Why? Because the economy is not doing well. Um, unemployment rates might be low, but remember, loads of people have exited the employment market, right? Mm -hmm. oh, um, yeah, so last year, yeah, okay. exactly. It's the way the stats mm -hmm. are put together. Also, you know, I mean, I mean, look. Previously, um, last year, year before, when we were looking to hire That's people, yeah. it was almost impossible to find people. And even when you did find those people, they wanted silly money and. There was wage price inflation. I think you've even got a yeah. graph on that. But you'll notice, actually, if you go to wage price inflation, you see how it's coming down now. Yeah. That's good because our productivity in the UK is terrible. I don't mean to be bashing the UK. I love my country. But people don't want to work, right? So you've got all these people that have left the, um, the market. They're not working. Because of, and I'm not going to go off on a rant, yeah, I exactly. certainly could do, come on. <laughs> but, you know, things like Brexit and all that, you know, we haven't got the people here that want to work and we're not bringing the people in. So our productivity is low because people are desperate to hire people for jobs and, and people are being hired for jobs when they're not even suitable for those jobs. Um, thankfully, wage price inflation is, is starting to come down. Um, I think it'll take a while for things to balance out again. If you go back to that previous graph, um, so yes, unemployment is low, but you know, that it's, that's, that's it's a good. a pretty big number. Yeah, yeah. You know, once you break it down, there's a lot of sort of underlying indicators but, uh, that are the issue. But but okay. As a whole, I mean, what I keep coming back to, low unemployment is a good thing. Mm -hmm. We have, looking at the top line number mm -hmm. without taking a deep dive into into the details, it's a good thing. Except you don't want it to be too low because it, it removes fluidity from the market. So the issue we're currently having is too much fluidity and the fact that... Uh, by fluidity you mean people moving jobs? Yeah, and a, lo a lot of younger people, mm -hmm. I mean historically a person was expected to stay at their job for about 30 years before, or at least 10 years, which was the usual tenure at a firm. Now, I mean, when you see the new graduates, their expectation is one to two years at a job. Yeah. So, and then go traveling around the world and. Uh, that, that, that's a separate story. But <laughs> sit, sit on a beach in Bali. <laughs> but also, the, the nature of the contract relationship between an employer and employee isn't as simple yeah, yeah. as you know. You are now an employee of the firm. A lot of there's a lot more flexibility baked in. So, what this number doesn't take into account is relative changes that are partly technology driven. Mm -hmm. AI and whatnot. Um, yeah. So. One, okay, one, actually, one thing I've got is, Go on. 
I, I would say it is a sign that the economy is doing well because your net migration is at 700,000 a year. So you're getting 700,000 people coming to the country and, pri- and wages, wages are still, still increasing. Surely if it wasn't performing that well, that influx of people coming in would mean that prices are going down. So the real question is, where are we doing on a global scale mm-hmm. relative to other countries? Okay, yeah, yeah. Right. And it's not that the economy is mm-hmm. doing badly. Mm-hmm. It's oh, it's relative when, to, yeah. yeah. And, and remember, you know, the, uh, I'm talking about productivity, mm-hmm. right? And you need all kinds of people to make an economy work, to keep, um, you know, th- there's jobs for everyone at every level. You know, you, you, you need... Uh, the cleaners, the builders, the bricklayers, the teachers, the doctors, the nurses, all the way up to your bankers, your accountants, your lawyers and architects and whatever else. And that's that whole spectrum. And what's happened in the UK is is we, we've, we've kind of hit this crunch where it's quite expensive to hire the right skilled people nowadays because not only have people left the workforce, remember a lot of older people during COVID just decided, you know what, forget it, I'll just start my retirement now. A lot of people who are younger, who are maybe five years or so into working, actually decided they want to change in the way that you know, their, their life works. And they might still be working, but they might be, you know, and again, I, I don't mean to take the mick, but they might be sitting on a beach in Bali and working remotely for a couple of days a week. Are you talking about but one of our children? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not mentioning any things. But, you know, it, and if you, if you imagine the unemployment figures, it also doesn't take account of... Underemployment. No, no but also how much people are working. Mm-hmm. If you're working two days a week, or if you're working five days, or if you know, part-time, you know, a few hours a day. So, so there's a lot of things muddled up in that. The only thing we can really do is... is just, you know, and I always say this, sometimes you've got to look away from the data and just look outside, right? And look across the country, talk to people. Um, and you start seeing, yes, the UK is still a great place, but we could be a lot more productive. And this is where I think we're losing a fight. Our productivity, and this is, I, I don't have the stats on me, our productivity is coming down. I, I think we're going to get sucked down a rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, okay, but only thing, one thing is that if wages are increasing, then surely productivity is increasing or not? It's, no, it's, not, not, it's not, not a direct correlation. No, because no. no. wages are increasing because it's supply and demand mm. of labour, right? Yeah. doesn't mean productivity is increasing. Yeah, so you get more people here. Yeah, and also... It's also the change in the nature of jobs, mm-hmm. which is the other thing that's driving yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. So you're getting higher tech mm. jobs that require mm. more specific niche Oh, because I guess that means some people might get massive pay rises, which compensates for the bottom people. My people at the bottom. Maybe it, not it's a pretty big it. number mm-hmm. when you look at it from a macro perspective. Fair enough. Okay, let's, let's get back into. Are we getting back into real <laughs> estate now? Uh, let's let's. So uh, I guess one one factor. Okay, so <clears throat> although you know we have pri- in, although salaries have been rising over the past two or so years, where's that money being spent? And I think a lot of that money is being spent on um, necessities rather than disposable income. So pe- that money is not going into the economy and booming it. It's actually going to people paying more rent, and you can see by this. And these two sheets here, where you know the forecast for rentals in London at least is five percent, UK six percent, and you know the rental value, the rent rents over the past you know five ten years have just gone up quite significantly, quite strongly. And you see the same thing in house price. But let's talk about rental first. Do we didn't see a lot of movement, mm-hmm. sort of, over the last, I don't want to say decade, but at least the last mm-hmm. sort of five years. It was a pretty predictable <coughs> tracking rate, sort of. Okay, you can expect rent to go up an X amount. And it wasn't directly correlated to the appreciation of the real estate values mm-hmm. over that time period. So a lot of this was expected in the last few years where we, th- we would expect a jump in the rental values. Now, it's also supply and demand driven. Mm-hmm. So what, but what tenants are looking for now, relative to what they were, it's higher spec. That's the other indication that's sort of driving mm-hmm. up rental values because good assets are being leased and they're driving the upward sort of increase in pricing, whereas older stock is being pulled for the market for redevelop- redevelopment. But then you come back to interest rates and the fact that not everything is financeable now, mm. which is good for Shojin because we fill that financing gap. Mm. Um, and we see that with you know, not developer projects, but you see that the projects we've got some quality assets that are a lot of built to rent, and that's really been one of the big drivers, hasn't it, recently? Definitely. Yeah. I think, I think built to rent is definitely the future. And, and in fact, just picking up on something you said there, actually a lot of landlords um, are selling up because yeah. you know owning individual properties just doesn't make sense anymore unless you're living in it, of course. Um, not only you know, things like the maintenance, but also you know, a lot of the regulatory requirements um, uh, you know, to, to rent those properties. These things are constantly increasing and all the, the tax breaks are going on and so on. I always mention this. But 
But th there's a number of other things going on as well. You know, post COVID, obviously, um, it accelerated how many people wanted to move out and get their own place. Yeah. Whereas for a while they were living with their parents and, and whatnot. Um, and, and this big kind of supply demand imbalance got made worse. So you had this big influx of people, and especially coming back into cities, mm -hmm. you had um, people, uh, landlords getting squeezed and looking just to sell their stock. You've got these new build to rent things, but they're not ready yet, right? So it will take a few years for them to come online. So you've seen this big jump in, uh, in rental values. And thankfully, it's starting to come down because we've hit an affordability gap in, in London. So it is starting to come down. And in other parts of the UK, um, in fact, if I can just go back for one second, you'll see even outside of London, um, the average has come down ever so slightly. The, I mean, there are, there are cities where things are booming. And in fact, we'll even look at this when we look at um, the, the sales values. But places like the Northwest, something like Manchester, is going from strength to strength to strength because they are attracting business. They're cre it is a mini London. They're creating lots of vibrancy there. Um, so, so, so they're doing something right there. Whereas London, you've still got this situation where we're just not building enough. We haven't got the space to build, and that's what really it, 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 supply, you know, the, it, it, uh, supply was squeezed. And that's what pushed, you know, anyone that could afford to pay more did pay more, but there's a point at which that, they That's why having the building boom, the commuter belt. All these oh. So that's, that's the other yeah. part. What this doesn't always pick hmm. up is the fact that transportation links have improved mm -hmm. and a lot more people are commuting from further away because they can't afford London anymore. So there's always that sort of mismatch in it overshoots, mm -hmm. settles, overshoots, settles, and it's also seasonal mm -hmm. because what a lot of people used to do was hold sort of seasonal rental flats, mm -hmm. which now they're looking to put up for fixed term rentals mm -hmm. because that seasonal yeah. sort of influx of tourists is less predictable. Mm -hmm. We're still going to get the spike in the summer, but you know, it's not as good as it used to be. Yeah, and if if you go to that one as well, so it's interesting here as well. I mean, you can see prices are still going up, but we have hit an affordability cap. But also, remember that big burst in in pricing was also um, at the same time the, the general inflation was shooting up. But over time, this is going to start to stabilize. I still believe, uh, and I might as well throw it out there now, you know how I love my little rants, but do not go into regular buy to let anymore, right? It just does not make sense. Um, I think there are better ways to invest in real estate, even if you still want the rental income to go into you know, complete buildings. But individual um, units for buy to let, I think are, you know, th those days are gone now. I think, I mean, other than the regulations mm -hmm. and the changes to the tax law, um, what's really driving that is new investments from institutional professionals. So you've got a lot of private equity money, a lot of pension fund capital that's going into these large buy to let schemes, and they've got economies of scale. Mm -hmm. They can price it a lot more efficiently, and they can manage it for a cheaper overall cost, and there's a lot more that goes into it rather than, so that's who you're competing against as an individual mm -hmm. buy to land mm -hmm. landlord. Yeah. So the market isn't where it was. It's you versus BlackRock. But <laughs> yeah, just... I mean, th th that's part of it. And then you still have to manage that tenant relationship. Mm -hmm. And you have to keep upgrading your offering. Mm -hmm. Because really, what you're competing against, if it's not you know, every penny, it's what other amenities you can offer. Swanky built rent schemes, or swimming pools, and tennis courts. And Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, but it's not just that. <clears throat> it's, it's your you know, energy and performance. Mm -hmm. So what's my leakage on my heating bill? Mm. Do I have air conditioning? Mm. In, in fact, uh, th there's a really good, um, you can see the pattern, right? I mean, student accommodation about, uh, when I was at student, uh, when I was a student at university, there was a, uh, in the 1960s, uh, <laughs> no, in the 1990s, you know, you'd be in these apartments, <laughs> there was eight bedrooms and you had shared bathrooms. Mm. It was grotty. There's no two ways about it. And that was one of the nice ones. But if you look at what students have been using in the last 20 years, 25 years, private student accommodation um, has boomed. And yep. they're all now used to these much more luxurious kind of environments to live in with ensuite bathrooms and all that. Now, if you think about it, when they graduate from university, they don't want to go into a grotty, damp studio no, in London somewhere, right? So they're, they're going to, you know, even, even if they have to spend a bit more of their income, they're going to want something nicer. That their expectations have changed. But it's a global so, trend and change mm, of expectations. Absolutely. It's not just UK driven. Mm, yeah. Because a lot of the investment comes from overseas. And their expectations is in line with the sort of 
global norm, which is, you know, you've got to have windows that work, you've got to have <laughs> air conditioning, <laughs> and ideally you've got to have a lift because no one's doing a five-story walk-up anymore. Yeah. Oh, they're all soft nowadays. Yeah, I just don't know. don't know. What about the, uh, the other side? So now we're talking about actual house prices. Yeah. Um, so there's three slides you've got. We've got transaction volumes, you've got the forecast, and we've got... Um, uh, price growth. This growth. is live TV, by the way, right? This is unscripted. <laughs> price, so. price growth over the, the price, price growth. And so this is um, actual, yeah, how you can see them sort of settled over the past few years. Um, past now, past six, few months, I guess, uh, a year or so. They haven't really moved up too much. Um, yeah, if anything, I mean, there has been a slight downward shift. But, but you know, again, the market's been in a funny place. Mm -hmm. there, there has been a very slight softening. And again, I always say is I hate charts like this, right? Because it's a nationwide chart. Yeah, this is probably better, right? Because every area, but even within each area, if you take London, right? Mm -hmm. London is saying it's going to soften by 4%. Mm -hmm. Depends where you are, yeah. right? London so is where, broken where, into... What are you saying? Where well, was, yeah, what's a the, thousand micro yeah, locations yeah. within London, right? And typically, would you say inner, the growth in the inner or the outer borough? Well, you can't even say that. You can't even say that because even in inner London, mm -hmm. you've got two, two. Well, you've got a number of different markets, and it depends but, on the underlying unit because mm -hmm. the older units aren't doing well. Mm -hmm. They don't have the capac. Sorry, they don't have the capital or access to the capital to upgrade the infrastructure in line with you know rental expectations. Mm -hmm. Newer units are doing well. Older units, not so much. Yeah. There's a lot more old units stuck in the market mm. that haven't had a chance to upgrade, which is why there is a general city-wide trend. Mm. But who's buying these UKs? So I'm, I'm a landlord and I'm selling my, my portfolio. Is another landlord buying it off me? Or are you saying institutions are stepping in to buy that? Or small institutions? Not institutions. Because like if no. you've got a buy-to-let yeah. portfolio, mm. it, it doesn't work for an institution. So it's, it's other smaller, individuals yeah. that yeah. are coming in. And it's also, they're dotted all over yeah. the place, yeah. right? But what I have seen is over the last kind of year, year and a half, um, and this is also a reflection of your earlier graph, actually, uh, that one, where you can see the price is softening ever so slightly because a lot of people, uh, like I said, firstly, landlords are exiting the market in droves. In fact, so am I. So if anybody wants to buy a portfolio, let me know. Um, but but the, 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 you know, because there are easier ways now to make money in real estate than be a landlord. And, um, and so with, with all of that going on, um, you know, the, the, these landlords are, are selling their properties. Anyone who's now kind of buying, a lot of the international buyers, for example, are actually liking, you said it, the, the, the new bold stuff, you know, the, the, the shiny stuff. So, so the market is really shifting um, geographically, globally as well. You know, there are certain areas people like to focus. For example, we've noticed the Far East market, mm -hmm. the, the Chinese, the Hong Kong market, and, and, and so on. They love the Northwest, mm -hmm. right? In yeah, fact, yeah. If, I, if, if I go down, have you got the Northwest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. third one down. There you go. Down. Right. In fact, if you look at the the total column, the mm. five years, yeah. you will see the northwest is actually amongst the best. So around Manchester, basically, mm. um, and 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 you know it's kind of no surprise because you know that's where you got all these shiny new buildings. The capital There's, value growth is noticeable. It's yeah. It's easily tenanted because there is also a decent take up rate, especially for new flats. The sales volumes are doing well. There's a lot of new developments, but those aren't due for completion at around the same time. They've staggered the growth. The growth is expanding outside the key mm -hmm. cities. So if you've got a relatively sort of well-sized plot, relatively central, <coughs> it's not a bad place to be. And, and the unit values, right? I mean, if you take Manchester, you know, uh, I think in the market it's generally said, is it two unit, uh, two bed units sell the fastest, uh, rent the fastest? Yeah. I can't remember, but let's say it's two bed units. A two bed unit in London will probably cost, you know, what, two, three times what it costs mm -hmm. in Manchester. So what, what someone like Manchester is doing is it's opening up the opportunity for people globally mm -hmm. who may not be as wealthy as the kind of guys that buy in Mayfair, yeah. but they want to invest in the UK. Well, if you can't do London, well, Manchester's your next, next best Sorry, I say next best. No offense to anyone in Manchester. Manchester could be even better. Um, and also, um, before we get complaints from our Liverpool investors, the Northwest includes <laughs> Liverpool and Manchester. Of course, of course. Yeah, can't, can't forget Liverpool. Liverpool. There you go. <laughs> um, but but there, there was. Um, back to the first one. <laughs> yeah, no, go, go to the next one. So this is quite right, interesting. Uh, I want you to explain what, what this actually means, this, this, this um, slide. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, this is the number of transactions being done annually. Now, so all the, how, this, this, so they're saying last year there was 7,000 sales houses, in yeah. UK houses. Correct. Houses. Okay. And what you don't have here is you don't have the data going further back. Mm -hmm. The long-term average number of sales per annum is about 100,000. It's about mm -hmm. 1.2 million per year. You'll notice that it's, it's dropped off in the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when the rates shot up after our friend Liz Trust came in, um, you know, People panicked. Like I said, a lot of people that were working in their twenties had never experienced interest rates, you know, above you know half a percent or something. Mm -hmm. So, and it's also you know there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. People didn't know which way to jump. Yeah. So it, it, everyone's just frozen. But what you are starting to see, and this is now, like I say, it's not necessarily reflected there, but you feel it out on the streets, is that people are now starting to accept that the cost of borrowing is higher. And if they want to buy, then they accept that, you know, it, it, that more of their income is now going to be used up in interest and so on. And actually, we're starting to see more um, engagement with buyers. Mm -hmm. First time buyers are coming back to the market. Um, That's movers. not the point to be made. This is closed transactions, mm -hmm. not listed properties and the relative movement in mm -hmm. You know, property listings is also a number we like to track, mm -hmm. which is where is the pricing sentiment. What happens a lot of the time when you see sort of market movement is landlords are looking to sell but have the financial flexibility with timelines. So they don't need to sell tomorrow. So they, they can, can afford sell. to wait for a they can afford to wait. They can afford to fire sale and get a look at Absolutely. Okay. Which, which comes back to how is the market doing as a whole. Mm -hmm. People aren't looking to fire sell right now. And, and, and I think that's precisely it. I mean, look, even as a landlord, I mean, I've had enough and I want to sell, but I'm not accepting deep discounts, right? You know, it's again the same thing. If you don't have to sell, why would you accept a deep discount now? And because of the, f the forward projections, I mean, we said in my prediction, obviously, there'll be two interest rate cuts this year. According to Kira, there'll four. be about four. Four. Three, so four, yeah. now I'm hoping he's right because that will increase the value of the flat time selling, right? So. You know, but, but the fact is, if I don't have to, if, if I'm not getting the right offer for it today, I'll just wait another six months. Yeah. And I'm not the only one. That's what's happening with um, a lot of other people out there. So oh. it should get better as the year goes on. What else? Pension. Um, I had something I was about to say. Uh, I can't remember now. Um, so, yeah, this is, again, transaction volumes, but is it... Is that the difference between sales prices and asking prices? What, what was that relationship as well? I think last year, last, the last time we had the market update, the view was that well, f prices aren't falling, they're still growing, but asking prices, asking prices are falling, house mm. prices are still solid. So right now, or is it prices? Is it being led by asking prices falling, or is it being led by a lack of demand? Or what, what would, what is causing that steadiness in home price? Or are you saying it was the interest rates and? High price, high price? I, th I think, I think people just try. It. I mean, look, uh, you know, again. I'll use my own example. I'm potentially looking to upsize again, mm. and but when I look out there, you know, when I do talk to agents, I'm going in quite cheeky as well. Whatever price someone is saying, I'm I'm asking them straight up, how much of a discount will they take, mm. right? And I think this is the point. Anybody that needs to sell will accept a discount. Mm. So that that's why prices have softened. Um, a lot of people have come to that point where they now need to sell. Not everyone, as a whole, the market's doing okay. However, individual circumstances have changed mm -hmm. considerably. Now, part of that driver is the segments of the economy that have done well haven't necessarily been correlated. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Healthcare is doing really well. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure is doing okay. Technology is doing very well. Not as well as the U US, but technology in the UK and Europe is still doing very well. Depends on what sector you're in. Real estate development is doing okay, construction not so much. Mm -hmm. Should be correlated, yeah, but yeah. not. <clears throat> so it really depends where you are, mm -hmm. which is why Jad putting in a cheeky offer mm -hmm. might not necessarily be a bad strategy. <laughs> because you just never know, yeah. right? <laughs> and um, but, but I think certainly, I mean, I have seen more confidence returning. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so people are holding tight a bit more now, because really, it, if they need to sell right now, could they push it out by three months? And if they could, the chances are they might get another 5% of well, the price. Are lenders giving you know, sellers flexibility? Or are they saying, yeah, you have a few, no, it's not, they're not calling shop saying, okay, calling, calling in loans or not? It's not no, it's, that. I mean, this is 
not probably the best way to say this, mm-hmm. a lot of it is driven by changes to the tax code and regulations, as well as it being more of a pain in the ass to manage, <laughs> rather than actual sentiment in, mm-hmm. you know, okay, I just want to sell it to get out yeah, of it, yeah, rather yeah. than, look, pricing is against me. And I guess one, one point I was going to mention earlier, I remember it now, is we're in an election year, do you think uh, there's going to be some sort of gift to the new, when new buyers? You know, there was that the buy to let not was the buy to let it was help to buy. There was. Do you think something like that? I love that. Something gift. About the, but that's what you know, because <laughs> there, there's something to push new buyers in. Because I guess Absolutely. the government's never going to allow house prices to afford to be, to be affordable. So the thing they can <coughs> do is make lending cheaper, uh, borrowing cheaper. So there's that thing about the one percent mortgage or hundred percent mortgages. Do you think that's something? That's something longer price? duration mortgages. Yeah, that's the, the yeah, thirty yeah, year yeah, mortgage yeah. product. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of sort of not just government driven, mm-hmm. even sort of driven by Yeah, because the 30-year mortgage is from, it's from a platform, right? It's from a Dutch platform. Yeah, Dutch so um, the, the, yeah. there's a lot of different ways to come to the same point. They want to make housing more affordable. Mm-hmm. By they, I mean both parties mm-hmm. at this point because they want to drive, you know, voters to their solution. But what that really means is it's good for the real estate market, mm-hmm. especially the mid-market residential space. Um, investor sentiment is good. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Usually, investor sentiment, they want investor sentiment to be good in an election year mm-hmm. because that drives um, voters and investors. And what that really comes down to is yes, we do expect something mm-hmm. from both sides that will encourage <coughs> buyers. Um, we still have a lot of mortgage solutions out mm-hmm. in the market, you know, a lot of which we didn't have a few months ago. And that's all a good thing. And, and I mean, you're seeing it already, right? I mean, they're talking about another tax giveaway, although I'm not sure if you can call it that, but uh, mm. in you know pre-election period, yeah. um, they're talking about, um, as you said, they've been talking about this for a while, uh, about the, uh, the 1% mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. deposit, yeah. they're talking about uh, cutting stamp duty, but again, a lot of that is really to boost the lower end of the market, mm-hmm. the first time buyers, second time buyers, that kind of thing. Um, frankly, whichever way it works is going to be brilliant for what we're doing because everything we focus on is the low to mid part of each yeah. local market. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Huh? <laughs> so, um, so actually, yeah, it's great. But again, it's the, but they won't, they, they, they be no, there's nothing they can do to, I guess, get rid of that supply demand imbalance over the next what, 10, 10 years because it's so so far gone. Because that, that's always been the core, the core um, thesis that the demand, supply demand balance in the UK is so big that there's always going to be house prices increasing. Or do you think the, that the grey belts are... The single biggest issue, mm-hmm. right, in the UK, we don't want to build on green belt. Obviously, they're now talking about grey belt. Um, and for those that don't know what grey belt is, I think it's basically pre. Uh, no, um, it's like people are, people assume that green belt means nice countryside, but there's areas that are technically green belt that are just old plots and old factories it's like and quite grotty. yeah, grey areas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and. Um, but we haven't wanted to build on the green belt generally. Mm-hmm. But also, because of nimbyism, the whole not in my backyard, councils don't want to go up. So what do you do? Something's got to give. And the problem with successive governments is they don't have the guts to take on <laughs> local people. What they've done now is they've put a lot of this, they put the pressure on the local councils mm-hmm. and have driven them to sort of make the decisions on where, on which plots of land are more suitable for developments, and that's sort of driving a lot of this, well, redevelopment. But you see, but but that being said, I still think that the single biggest point, like if you take Manchester, and again, I keep going back to Manchester, I studied there, I love the place, right? It was a very different place back then, but look around Manchester, look at all the new buildings going yeah. up, left, right, and center. Their, their mayor has done an amazing job with that city. The problem with other places is no one's willing to take on the locals, right? And with, with this kind of nimbyism going on, you're, you're not going to address it. The supply-demand balance will not get addressed. Not by the Tories, not by Labour coming in, it just won't. Because it's, it's too politically charged. So what they'll do is they'll mess around kind of yeah, around a, a, a few bits. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what I am hoping to see, and, and I think it's now starting to happen, which is good, and actually, uh, to be completely fair to him, I think it's Boris Johnson's idea, you know, about the um, Northern Powerhouse and all that mm-hmm. stuff. And it's Dave Cameron, Northern Powerhouse. Was it Dave yeah, Cameron? Dave Cameron that was when they were rejigging yeah. the pension schemes and then. Oh, really? Uh, wasn't Bojo? No, it wasn't Bojo. Oh, I thought he, he did something good there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, if. It's really bringing the other cities up. If, if we can't build in London, so be it. Mm-hmm. 
let's build in all the other cities because that will attract people, it will attract the kind of nightlife and it will make people want to live in those places. So the weird thing is supply and demand isn't going to be addressed in the next five, ten years. But as a long term plan, we still need to regenerate and boost all the regional cities. The UK is one of the only countries, major countries, major economies in the world that has one major city, right? As in one uh, city that controls the bulk of the economic kind of power. But that's got to change, right? So, so I'm hoping that it will. If Labour comes in, like I said, everyone will make little tweaks to it, but hopefully in the long run we will get that. It's almost sounded like uh, you're. Are you putting your hat in the ring for the London Mayor's? Uh, oh, God, no. No <laughs> chance. <laughs> um, so I think we, we covered that. I guess we can move to questions. And I guess the, the, one of the key questions we've been getting, which just leads on from your point, is um, what do you think is going to be the implications of a Labour government if that looks like, as it looks like to happen? But, yeah, for, At least I think, it's not Jeremy Corbyn, and that's all <laughs> I can say. Because initially, I think, last year when, when it was on the cards, people, a lot of people were quite, quite scared. I guess now we're saying it's not that different. What, what's your... So a, lot, the market say, well, how, uh, a lot of the commentary coming out of the Labour camp has been very similar to the Conservatives. Yeah, yeah, like, don't they don't want to admit yeah. it, but I think everyone sort of learned a les lesson from Liz Truss, which is don't go too far too fast mm -hmm. because it's going to drive the markets wild. So everyone's recommending gradual changes, mm -hmm. which is a good thing for market sentiment because, you know, gradual changes are easy to correct. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not really worried either way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would say, um, you know, lab, Labour, since Corbyn times, has certainly moved more back to the centre. Um, and again, look, I, I don't know this, but rumour has it that Blair is kind of in the background telling them, you know, the, the right strategy to, to win the next election. But to be honest, um, I'm not sure how much of a strategy they need because the Tories are doing a fantastic job of blowing themselves up. I mean, you know, poor Rishi, I actually like Rishi, but the poor guy, it's like everyone's just stabbing him from every single side, his own party. There's absolutely no way. In fact, I, I, I will I'll bet anything there's absolutely no way. I, I'll, I'll vote for Tory, but there's oh, no yeah, way no, they'll no, get no, it. No, 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 <laughs> come on. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> vote Tory. No, but no, in, in reality, I think there's nothing wrong. Um, I'm getting more comfortable with Labour, but... Labour have to bring in some um, proper lefty policies to keep their party members happy. But they have been trying to attract and work with a lot of businesses recently. In fact, that's been their, their constant talk. They're supporting business and so on. And, and I think what they're, if you, if you look at everything they're doing, they're trying to pull a Tony Blair, which is a good thing, right? It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. They're trying to kind of get enough support from the other side to to you know to show that they're not going to blow up the country with you know mm -hmm. hardcore socialist policies so to be honest i don't even mind anymore that's the thing yeah thanks but you but, but i guess you're, you're sort of more plugged into the international market the international investors are comfortable with the fact that they could be a new government they're not, they're not worried about yeah. it changing anything look w one of the big changes that we saw was the change in tax treatment mm -hmm. for um res non-doms and that 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 sort of that that change has already sort of come into play, mm -hmm. and and that has had a big impact so far. It has. I mean, it has had somewhat of an impact, mm -hmm. but did a lot of people see it coming? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and it's sort of it's over long term status. So mm -hmm. it's one of those things that it, you know, it just is what it is, and it's going to make an impact in the long term, but not in the short term. Okay. Yeah. So good. That makes sense. Um, I guess <clears throat> some of the questions we've got are project specific. So for them, project specific ones, myself or Kirat will get back to you uh, individually. Um, I guess one of the questions we've got is in the rising, rising or falling interest rate environment. What does how does that affect Shojin and our investment opportunities? Um, Chuck, are we are your investors covered? Or is it is it positive? When the interest rates are falling, having a fixed return product. So previously, pre Liz Trust, everything was done on a fixed rate basis, both us and the senior loans. In fact, nearly all the senior loans on the developments were fixed rate. Naturally, with what happened, everyone's shifted to variable, mm -hmm. but it's almost you know a bit too late because actually <coughs> rates are not going up anymore. Mm -hmm. They're going to come down. So it actually works in our favour now mm -hmm. that they're all on variables. Um, 
in our case though, we we just do fixed rates. I mean, you know, variable, the, the, the variation in, in variable rates matters more <coughs> when the numbers are small. Mm -hmm. But, you know, remember we're charging between 20 and 35% or mm -hmm. thereabouts, depending on whether it's mezzanine or preferred equity um, per annum. So really the, you don't need variability on that. I mean, how much will rates move, you know, quarter, quarter percent, half a percent, doesn't make much difference. It also comes back to the yield curves and, you know, where we're looking at inflation going. So okay. mm -hmm. we like fixed term products. Mm -hmm. Certainty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is, it's, what's the process with, with dealing with non-performing contractors? It's a specific question, but yes, we can talk through that, yes? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so <clears throat> first of all, you know, I, I think a lot of people don't realize it. So you've got the developer, who's the, who's the one we're lending to. The developer then appoints uh, what's called a main contractor. The main contractor is the one who's signing up to a fixed price with the developer <coughs> saying, I'll deliver this project for X. <coughs> the main contractor will then go and have multiple subcontractors. And again, before they even uh, give the pricing and everything, they know roughly how much each of the subcontracts is going to be. And then upon signing the main contract, they'll normally lock in the subcontracts as well. So, so you know, really on day one, you've got everything there, it's all structured. Now, a number of things can happen. The contractors and subcontractors can go bust, um, you know, especially if there are price increases in the market, then, um, you know, a subcontractor that said they would do a job at, or, you know, something at half a million pounds, if their material price increases by 20%, he might say, you know what, this just isn't even worth doing. And, and unfortunately, the way it works in the construction industry is they'll just collapse the company and then they'll open another one. Now, on our end, with the, certainly with the larger projects, what we do is we do something uh, called, uh, we take something called a performance bond. So firstly, with the main contractor, we check that their balance sheet is strong enough to deliver the project end to end, that they can absorb any shocks from their subcontractors as well in case something happens. So you know it's a, it's a solid company in the first instance. That's with most of the big development construction projects that, that we fund. But then you also have something <coughs> called a performance bond. So if that main contractor did go bust, then what the performance bond does is, is when you go out to the market, and let's say they went bust because the whole market shifted by 20, 30% in pricing, then what the insurance does is it gives you the gap uh, in, in the pricing. So you can go and get another contractor, even though they're going to cost 20% more, and especially because it's halfway through a project, that always costs a bit more anyway, the insurance will kick in and, and pay that difference. So most of the projects we run now tend to be the, the larger projects, and so we normally do have performance bonds in place. And I mean, on, on the same thing, you know, what we're doing as sort of part of the background, sort of the technology enablement, is we're getting more visibility on the payment schedules down to the subcontractor as well as the deployments down to the subcontractor. And that's, you know, part of what the investment team does. Great. Um, and then another question is, this one should probably answer itself, um, what are the best regions to look for buy-to-let opportunities? Chat says none. Don't do it. Don't <laughs> do it. <laughs> for, for an investor that wants buy-to-let, you know, the the leverage and the income, what's the alternative for them for that? There are other fixed-term income products that I would recommend. Mm -hmm more than some of the... Hmm. <laughs> but it's always been, I guess, I guess the, the, the people buy-to-let, you can leverage good, yourself and you get the cash flow. It's a good is, idea yeah. to help fund buy-to-let developments. Mm -hmm. I like that more than being an owner mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. a... I think the return, it's just not juicy enough. For the yeah. hassle you're going to go through, just not juicy enough anymore. Like I said, if you're going to do buy-to-let, buy the whole building. Right? If you can afford it, buy the whole building because you're starting to get economies of scale, which brings down your costs and so on. Um, if you can't buy the whole building, um, you know, invest, you know, from time to time, we will acquire an entire building and you'll have an opportunity to invest in that where you'll get the same, if not a better return than what you would on an individual buy to let. In fact, it's one of the reasons I'm selling everything so that I can invest in all of these things because it's just less hassle. Great. And another question is, <clears throat> What's Georgian Pipeline looking like over the next uh, quarter? Um, I guess we can't talk about specific projects uh, given uh, right now, but we've got 
it's a very, very strong fight band. It's probably one of the strongest we've ever seen it. It's a real good quality project. Um, you know, as you can see, the team's been growing. We got more sophisticated with how we're working. So, you know, be able to really find some real gems, I think. And there's a couple of really, really nice ones coming up mm. that we're very excited to share, but we need to get the details <laughs> first. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, yeah, watch this space. I mean, they'll, they'll be launching... It's a bit like buses, right? You know, we were hoping to uh, spread out the launches, but it looks like there a few of them are going to have to launch around the same time. So just be ready for it um, over the next, what, couple of weeks, would yeah. you say? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the final one is Shoujin is lowering its, min lowered its minimum investment to £1,000. Why was that? I guess there's a great video that Jack did about it, but you can maybe talk about Thanks. it. Great video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, look, it, very, very simply... We wanted to be very careful about when we started lowering the minimum investment. We've got to be able to make sure that um, administratively, you know, on the back end, everything works and, and so on. Um, and, and, you know, we test drove it just before ISA season yeah. ended, right? And actually it was, it was quite good. And I found, or we found that w what it did was it encouraged people that hadn't previously invested to actually test drive a few bits. Um, you know, and just trial investment a few things. It also meant that people that just had money sitting in their wallets, you know, which was a, a scrappy amount, three grand or something, actually they could now put that to work, right? You know, a grand in, in three different projects or something. So, and we realized actually, I think it does create a lot of value. Um, so, so we've done it. And um, really, you know, the, the goal of, you know, with Shojin is ultimately to enable more people to invest into this sector. So it was always our intention to gradually lower it. One day we will get to a hundred pounds, but you know, right now uh, it's, it's been dropped to, you know, from 5,000 to a thousand. So, um, you know, uh, hopefully that, that helps more, more people get engaged. Brilliant. Um, I think we are about done with the questions. Uh, do you want to check there's any on Zoom? I just can't see. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh, was. Um, oh yeah, hang on. Okay. Second, second. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, that's that. Um, so Richard, we will get back to you. Um, first, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, just just to reiterate, the question was really what what can show how can Shojin help investors with investing into this sector? And so, um, you know, and we're always happy to have one to one conversations as well. So we should definitely reach out and do that later. Um, Someone's asking about the minimum investment. Yep, so we'll go with that. Thousand pounds now. Um, is the market going to improve this year? I guess we did cover that. Um, and I guess with the market improving, a lot of our projects that are you know looking to exit will hopefully exit in that, in that time frame. Because mm. I think we timed it well, where we got a big chunk of projects we choose to exit so the latter half of the year, where interest rates will hopefully drop. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and then Th this um, a question from Richard about does Shojin currently offer rental income products? Um, so we did have the West, we had a one product that was offering regular income. We had two tranches, and the regular income tranche was fully subscribed for. Yeah. Um, it's something that I guess we look to do in the future, but it has to have um, a very steady, steady stream of income. You can't be consistent with it, I guess. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and also, you know, from time to time, uh, just like we did with Nottingham, you know, if we're getting a cracking deal, um, then we'll do it. And, um, you know, I, I guess that's really good for investors as well. I know, I know some other platforms, you know, where it was their core business. Mm -hmm. And so they almost had to keep buying assets and at market value. And really in the long run, that didn't make sense because the, the margins got squeezed. And I think, I think that's a, actually a really good point that we can probably finish on is that that whole life cycle thing where we invest at the start. Mm. The problem is when it's, when it's, a, when it's a empty plot or existing block. A lot yeah, of the capital then, value growth is exactly, so you can, during that, the initial stages. And then we can secure the exit. And then for what happens is you invest as an investor, you can invest in the project when it's at the ground level, yeah. mm -hmm. then when it's built and it's we sold it off, yeah, when it, or when it's, when it's let it tends to that or let it out, then you can invest in the real income of it. So you get a full cycle of it. And I think because we're buying it out, because we're buying it at that early stage, mm. we can get, get, can get a discount. So your, your actual returns are pretty strong, which is what exactly what we saw with Nottingham Project. That's, that's exactly yeah. Nottingham, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, 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 and you know, different investors have different preferences in terms of the risk profile. Um, you know, it helps with diversification. So so I think I think there will be more of these coming. Um, and but like I say, it's all very very opportunistic. You know, if we get a cracking deal, we'll do it. All right. Um, yeah, I think we're just about done. Perfect our time. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, please um, drop us an email at invest <coughs> at or give us a call 
Um, thank you and have a nice rest of the evening. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. See ya.